Welcome, dear colleagues. Welcome, dear educators from all over the world to our 20th webinar hosted by your educational hub, Juan Kwan Village, establishing a practical electrical engineering program without breaking the bank. By honor today to have a great educator with us, an innovative educator, Mr. Scott Campbell. Welcome, Mr. Scott. Mr. Campbell, welcome, hey, please. Good day, John. Thank you for that introduction. We're honored to have you with us, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Scott uh, Campbell is a dreamer. And like most dreamers, he has grand ideas on how to make the world a better place. Recently, he has founded an educational not-for-profit which aims to do just that. But this is not the first time Scott has taken on an ambitious undertaking though. Moving around a lot as a child, Scott has attended many schools, both at home and abroad. And at the age of 16, he returned to Canada after studying in Japan. Still in high school at the time, Scott started his own company. And by the age of 18, his company was already turning a profit and had been granted a federal tax ID. During this time, Scott balanced his commercial contracts with the pursuit of a higher education and earned a total of six degrees from Sheridan, St. Lawrence, Queens, Thompson Rivers University, and the University of Cumbria. While operating his company, Scott also branched off into research and development, developing and patenting the world's first 3D RML technologies. Then, in 2012, Scott sold his company so he could pursue his dream and becoming, of becoming a teacher. Since then, Scott has worked all over China and has helped a number of schools launch their own STEM programs. However, recently, Scott has started shifting his attention back to the private sector. Not for higher personal gain, but for the pursuit of a higher purpose. His organization, Sino Exchange, or so small, is now providing educators and students alike access to free education resources. Why? So that anyone, regardless of their social or economic background, can have the opportunity to learn. Welcome again, Mr. Campbell. We are very, very honored to have a great innovative and role model leading education like you, especially in STEM, STEM education, and the floor is all yours. I will start, Mr. Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, John. Uh, I'm absolutely, yes. Yeah, you can hear me, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, the internet's uh, cutting out a bit. Um, hopefully it will be stable. Uh, so thank you very much for that that wonderful introduction, and I'm absolutely honored to be presenting on behalf of Huat uh, Kwan Village today. Um, it looks like we've lost subtitles to the internet connection. Please make sure everyone who are on mute more so you can enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. My first question, Mr. Campbell, will be, Based on my 33 years of experience in education worldwide, I noticed that electrical engineering and electronics topics and standards are almost absent from a lot of education entities curricula and pedagogical scope and sequence. Is this true knowing that electrical computer engineering is considered one of the current and future growing pillars of the world labor market and why? Mr. Campbell? Uh, yeah. yeah, so this is a great question. Uh, over the past decade, I... oh. this connection there for a moment. We're, we're losing you now. You're back. So you're losing me? Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, let's.
Hello, John? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, hopefully this connection will be a little bit better. Um, all right. Uh, so let's uh, back up again, um, just in case uh, we kind of lost part of the beginning of that question. Um, so yeah, this is a great question that you just asked. Um, and over the past decade, I've read numerous government reports indicating that there's serious labor shortage in the field of electrical and computer engineering. And these skill shortages have become a pressing issue for major global economies such as the United States, the United Kingdom, and China, just to name a few. But why are so many nations not having enough engineers to meet the demands of these critical sectors? And what is the uh, educational industry doing to address these needs? Well, most will say that ramping up STEM education will do the trick. But is this the reality of what's actually happening? Regrettably, based on my observation, it's not. Over the past 10 years, I've consulted with numerous schools all over China and abroad. And what have I seen? Okay. Electrical... Yeah, but we all pizza then. Pardon? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Continue, Mr. Campbell. Please, everyone, make sure you mute both so you can enjoy the presentation. Go ahead, please. Uh, so what I've seen is electrical and computer engineering is entirely absent from everyone's action plans. And part of this is probably based on the finding of numerous educational reports, which have indicated that electrical engineering is the most expensive program that schools can offer. And this fact alone would be enough to dissuade most administrators to um, support the, the development of these programs. In fact, electrical engineering is second only to the sciences, whereas courses such as math and English usually come in as the cheapest according to these reports. Moreover, as there's a lack of professionals in these sectors, there's also a lack of professionals, be it from industry or from the educational sector that are qualified to teach engineering without additional training. But what about teachers who might be interested in learning? Well, based on the discussions that I've had with numerous uh, professional educators, most of them indicate that there's a lack of support and materials needed to implement changes to the curriculum. And this phenomenon is not unique to engineering. In fact, it's almost universal across all, all subject areas. And finally, in my discussions with teachers, I found that many feel that the idea of electrical engineering is just too difficult and are hesitant to even try implementing a practical engineering program, even if the materials were made available to them. So this presents a major obstacle for society at large as there seems to be no viable way forward, but that doesn't need to be the case. As such, I've spent countless hours over the years assessing the obstacles and finding ways to implement electrical and computer engineering programs into the curricula. And what have I discovered in this time? If done properly, a practical engineering program can be just as economical as the average math or English classes. This means that a practical engineering program is a viable possibility for most schools. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Yep. So I don't want to spend a lot of time right now to show you where to find all these resources that we'll be talking about in today's presentation. But just so you're aware, um, everything is available on Sino Exchange free of charge. And here you can see some of the different projects and explanations that you can download and use in your own classes, classroom should you like. Now, Sino Exchange is a, a charity program which is operated by five subjects uh, experts who volunteer their time to develop high quality learning resources that can be shared with students and teachers, regardless of their social or economic background. Now, um, of course, uh, there's myself uh, who founded the platform, uh, but we also have Nancy Hu, who's a member of the Chinese Communist Party and acts as our main liaison while also working on translating our resources. Uh, Dr. Gary Weston, who's a former UCLA professor and has his PhD in nuclear physics. Uh, Lauren Tabor, who has a master in biology and chemistry. And Eddie Chong, who's a computer science major. Um, so we have an amazing team of experts that all volunteer their time to create the learning resources that, that we're gonna be talking about in today's presentation. And again, uh, these resources are available um, free of charge. Uh, we share them openly as part of our charity. So as I indicated earlier, uh, electrical engineering is the main focus of today's presentation. And I'd like to start by sharing this report uh, from the UK, which indicates numerous skill shortages in critical sectors to the economy. Now, the ones that I've highlighted in yellow are all related to computer and electrical engineering. But it's not just the United Kingdom, which has serious shortages. In fact, most developed nations are facing this, these challenges. And this is actually kind of surprising for me to see because when you look at the IGCSE physics curriculum, there's a huge section on electromagnetism in the curriculum. And electronics is also covered in the design technology curriculum as well. And there's even an IGCSE course called electronics. But unfortunately, many of these courses tend to approach electronics from a theoretical standpoint only. And they don't actually get into the applied application of the theory, which is what we really need to be focusing on. Um, 
That is, if we're going to address the global skill shortages in these critical sectors to the economy. So what we really need to do is to find a way to keep the cost down while still providing students with meaningful learning opportunities. Yes, thank you very much for this very descriptive and very constructive answer, uh, Mr. Campbell. Yes, I agree that uh, always when it comes to education, you know, there is no budget, but in general, we must remove that illusion that we need uh, a big financial and the West, that's why today's main aim is to show everyone that you can do STEM, you can do STEAM education with uh, not, even if you don't have enough financial resources, it's feasible. And that's why it's a very creative presentation today. My next question, Mr. Campbell, will be, so many educators concede within time that facilitating and integrating electronics and electrical engineering within the learning facilitating habitat of schools is very challenging and it needs a lot of effort and financial resources. How can we overcome those challenges and how can you define to our attendees the different methods to facilitate electronics within our classrooms simply and efficiently as any other subject? Well, there's different methods that teachers can use to teach electrical engineering, which I'm going to be elaborating on in just a moment. And each of these approaches has its own strengths and weaknesses. But you might be surprised to know that the most expensive options out there actually have the lowest impact on teaching and learning. In contrast, the cheapest options um, tend to have the greatest measurable impacts towards developing the desired learning outcomes, while also laying the foundations for the development of other skills such as CAD down the line, which I'll talk about later on. However, the hardest thing for us as educators is to design projects that are aligned to specific learning outcomes rather than just focusing on the project itself. And this has been a major issue that organizations such as the World Economic Forum have identified as a major shortcoming of many STEM products and curricula. Regrettably, we can't really rely on companies to solve this problem for us. And this is because corporate interests generally focus on making marketable products that are easy to implement and can make the company as much money as possible rather than focusing on higher learning outcomes. Therefore, as educators, we need to work together to lead the change that we want to see in education for ourselves. So what do you need to start teaching practical engineering skills in your classroom? Well, there's a few different solutions out there that you can use. We can look at using do-it-yourself kits, breadboards, which are pretty common in a lot of computer science classes, prototype boards, and printed circuit boards. And in just a moment, I'm gonna talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each of these methods. Now, if you're unfamiliar with any of these approaches uh, to implementing electronics, do-it-yourself PCB boards uh, look like this. And uh, the circuits are pre-designed and you get all of the parts that you need. Therefore, students only really need to assemble the circuit for themselves. Uh, next, we have prototype boards. And these are basically a blank slate, which allow the designer to create any circuit that they could, could imagine. And finally, we have breadboards. And breadboards are basically the same idea as prototype boards, but they have the ability to be rewired and we can use, reuse the parts as well. So we could modify the design or reuse the parts as necessary. Now, do-it-yourself circuit boards are popular resources that school use as they try to develop electrical engineering programs for the first time. They are quickly assembled, which is a bonus for a lot of people. However, there's limited customization. Actually, in reality, there's no customizations that the students can make. The circuit is pre-designed and you can only assemble it in one way. It also doesn't come with replacement parts. So if a student loses a part, damages a part, or inserts a part incorrectly, well, you're kind of tough out of luck. You basically need to throw away that circuit and start all over again and start with a new kit. Uh, and there's also a lack of scaffolding. There's no way of really differentiating this project to make it easier or more difficult uh, based on your student's needs. So from an educational standpoint, these are not actually all that good because there's no scaffolding, there's no differentiation, and there's no way for students to customize the designs. And realistically, they're not really learning how, how or why the circuit works. They're just assembling the circuit and they don't really have to give it much thought. So I want to uh, refer to an idea from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, so any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, a lot of these do-it-yourself circuit kits um, that are, are, are actually quite advanced, but the students don't understand how or why they actually work. They just understand what it's doing, but they don't understand how the circuit operates. So from this standpoint, the project is basically just magic to them. But we want to help our students move beyond the rudimentary knowledge of what something does 
and start developing deeper understandings of how and why the uh, things work in, in the real world. So the next option is breadboards, and this is a commonly used approach to teaching electrical engineering in more advanced programs. Now you might think that I'm gonna recommend this approach since it's commonly used, but you might be surprised to know that this is not my preferred method of instruction. And I'll get, uh, get into this in just a moment. Now, one of the biggest problems with breadboards is how confusing the wiring is. And you can really see this. Even in this simple circuit, we have wires going all over the place. It's like a complex labyrinth that you have to navigate. And this makes it very difficult for students to figure out what's happening and why. And this is because the connections are very abstract. We don't really have nice clean connections between the power to connect to a component and then back to the ground again. Now, technically we do have the ability to reuse parts, but what tends to happen is the parts just get, tend to get thrown away anyways, because it takes too much time to sort and organize them. So although the parts are technically reusable, in reality, they don't get reused. And breadboards also lack permanence. Now, this isn't necessarily an issue per se, but I really like to have projects that students can take home and show their parents. And with the idea of breadboards being reusable, they can't really do that. So my final thought about breadboards really is represented really well by this quote from Leonardo da Vinci. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Now we can simplify breadboards by taking the time to simplify our circuit, uh, like what you see in this example here. But even with all of the time and effort that's gone into simplifying it, the connections are still quite abstract. Now for me, I can follow the circuit. However, for a student who's just learning electronics for the first time, this can be quite difficult. So there's another method that I find far more beneficial for students to use when learning electronics for the first time. And that's the prototype board method, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. Here I'm showing you three identical representations of the same circuit. On the left, I've created a USB cell phone charger using a breadboard, and I have that same circuit to the right using a prototype board, and the electrical schematic for both is shown in the bottom left corner. Now, which one of these circuits do you think is easier to understand and why? And I'll give you a moment to think about that, um, and maybe you can even uh, post your response in the chat box as well. So, uh, with the example to the right, you can easily see logical connections between the different components. And this circuit uh, layout looks almost identical to the electrical schematic. So it's incredibly easy to see how the parts interconnect with one another and compare that to the physical circuit board and the layout of, with the electrical schematics. And this makes it much easier for students to visualize and understand the circuit um, uh, as they start learning electronics for the very first time. Moreover, as a teacher, this is representative of best practices in education. We always want to find ways to simplify things, making it as easy as possible for our students to learn and understand complex topics. Because our students already have so many things that they need to worry about already. So the last thing they need to do is worry about added complexity where it's not needed. And this brings us to the benefits of using prototype boards when teaching absolute beginners. So the first thing I, um, I wanna talk about is the idea of modular circuits, creating experimental circuits that will provide you with the ability to rapid prototype new designs quickly and easily. So in this exam uh, example, I'm showing a standard electronics kit that you can buy, and it's not overly expensive. And it allows you to do a number of circuit experiments with minimal prep. However, I'm not a big fan of these pre-made kits as they have limited options beyond the initial experiments. And what I really wanna be able to do um, is to achieve long-term is to get our students beyond these initial experiments and start designing their own experiments. Therefore, rather than using st a store-bought kit like this, I like to get the students to build their own modular circuits and then use those circuits to build uh, their experiments instead. So I'm gonna show you what a student-made modular experiment kit would look like. Outstanding, outstanding. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Really, uh, your answers already are uh, all of the you have a question in the chat box and a lot of uh, answers for your questions. Uh, outstanding, thank you very much. And my question number three will be: What are the main pedagogical benefits of modular circuits usage and integration within the differentiated lifelong learner environment, specifically when students want to recreate their drawn circuit diagrams, generate live data? and acquire, explore, identify electrical, electronic related knowledge and skills. 
Well, a modular uh, circuit project like this provides a number of advantages which may not immediately be evident, and they may actually save you a lot of time down the line. As for myself, I always do this project in a foundations course, but I'll often jump straight into simple circuits in more advanced course offerings. Regardless of the approach that you use, it's important to always offer supportive and scaffolded approaches to this kind of project-based learning so that your students are given the opportunity to develop the skills that they need to su succeed. As for the advantages of doing a modular circuit uh, project like this, opposed to skipping this type of project completely or using a pre-made kit, well, the act of building these modular circuits will expose the students to the idea of building a prototype board on their own, which will help them down the line. Secondly, and this is uh, more important in my opinion, by building these modular circuits, students are given the opportunity to develop the tactile skills that they will need to design, build, and test more advanced circuits in the future. This creates a safe learning environment where skills become cumulative and has countless advantages to teaching and learning. Moreover, by developing a logical sequence where one lesson leads into another, students uh, need, only need to focus on one or two big ideas at a time. But more importantly, students will begin to see how advanced concepts are interconnected, and this will help, see, help them see the relevance of what they're learning. That being said, uh, one of the biggest problems with electrical engineering in most cases is that the minimum point of entry is typically quite high. So it's important for us as educators to break things down into more manageable chunks so that we can make the learning curve much more gradual for our students. Therefore, with a modular circuit experiment like this, the students only need to focus on how to build a simple circuit board. And although this, though this may seem simple, it's actually a lot more complex than it sounds. For instance, you'll find that there will always be a number of students that try to take shortcuts when doing this project, such as not properly measuring a wire or not properly stripping the insulation, et cetera. And this will often result in a circuit that doesn't work. And that's to be expected. But simple circuits like this, uh, students can easily uh, see their mistakes and they can see the impacts of those mistakes on their experiments when they go into the group project stage. And this process of learning from one's mistakes is important as you don't want students trying to attempt more complicated designs without first having the prerequisite skills uh, that are needed. This includes having the theory necessary to design a circuit, but also the practical skills needed to build and test it. Now, once we have a number of modular circuits, we can then start using them to conduct various design challenges, which will become increasingly more complex. So give your students a series of electrical schematics and then have them try to figure out how to build each of these circuits using the components that they have available to them. Moreover, each challenge should have the students compare and contrast different part configurations to help them understand the finer nuances of each component. For example, in the first experiment, students would need to determine if the direction that an LED is installed makes a difference, whereas experiment two would have the students compare and contrast the difference between an SPST switch and a push switch, and so on. Furthermore, students would also develop a number of visual literacy skills as they learn how to read an electrical schematic and translate that into a physical circuit. And using their modular circuit board, their final experiment might look something like this. In this example, we can see um, uh, how the students would connect multiple modular circuit boards to create a more complex circuit design. So here's a short video of students using those modular circuits to conduct an experiment in the classroom just so you can get an idea of what this type of project would look like in practice. Now, the next thing I wanna do is have the students design their own circuits based on what they've learned from conducting the modular circuit experiments. Here, students would need to figure out how to combine and consolidate all of those modular circuits to create a new circuit design. And this would require them to design, build, and test their own ideas. Now, in this example, we have a circuit that could be used as a flashlight. And this design uses two different switches in parallel, which allows the operator to use this apparatus in one of two modes. First, the operator can turn the flashlight on indefinitely using the on-off switch, or they can momentarily activate the light using the push switch. So this is an interesting way to use these basic uh, components uh, with a simple parallel circuit design to add some functionality. And this is what we really wanna see from our projects. We don't necessarily want our students just building a project that's been prescribed to them, but we wanna have them to have the skills and knowledge necessary to develop their own ideas into something that they could build and test for themselves. Now, moving on to slightly more complex examples, um, you can see in, uh, that this circuit operates um, a string of flash, flashing lights, which could be used at Christmas, Chinese New Year's, or at a graduation ceremony. 
Now, this circuit uses the exact same components that were um, covered in the modular circuit experiment, and all of these components are referenced in the IGCSC physics curriculum as well. However, the design of, of this A-stable multivibrator circuit is quite advanced, even though it only uses a few simple parts. And here's another example that's related to science, and this circuit is a water level sensor. As the popsicle stick is placed into the water, the corresponding lights, green, yellow, and finally red, will light up as the water level raises uh, relative to the sensor. And this type of circuit could be used as a rain gauge in a weather experiment. And my last example before moving on is a circuit uh, design that's been made to control the safety light systems of this model plane. And these are all circuit designs that only use a, few, a select few electrical components that are typically covered in most high school curriculums. However, while most national curriculums that I've reviewed do cover some elements of electronics, they typically only approach electronics from a theoretical standpoint. However, all of these examples are just using LED lights, resistors, capacitors, and transistors. There's nothing overly complex or fancy being used in these examples, such as integrated circuits. But even with limited materials, you can see that we're still able to create numerous projects that address real world needs. And that's really what STEM is all about how we can use science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to solve real world problems. And that brings me to another idea of how we can provide scaffolded learning opportunities to help our students attempt more complex concepts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Campbell, for this detailed, constructive self and peer assessed description based on real life based education and passion, relevance, attitude approach, justifying and uh, uh, proving that STEM education is the basis of real life education and the basis of 21st century lifelong learning education. My question number four will be these circuits look a lot more complex than the modular circuit you showed earlier, yet, they still appear to be modular in nature. Can you tell us yet more about this example, please? Uh, yeah, um, and I think uh, we just lost a connection here. Um, give me a moment. Yes, please, go ahead. But we can hear you. Okay. And uh, is the uh, presentation coming through again? Yes, 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 it's there, yeah, we can hear you, yeah. And the okay. subtitles too. Go ahead, please. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, uh, we just lost a connection there. The Wi-Fi is not very good where I am right now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, these are, um, this example here, uh, these circuits are modular in nature as well, uh, but they are standalone circuits. Mm -hmm. uh, but these examples are actually from the computer engineering course that we're developing. Um, however, the combination of these circuits shows different components of an ATX power supply, uh, which can be found in every desktop computer. Uh, in these projects, uh, the students would learn theory through a number of practical experiments, which would help them uh, validate that theory. Mm -hmm. However, each project in itself is a component of a much larger whole. Uh, therefore, by the end of these projects, students would have completed numerous circuit experiments that would interconnect with one another to create a much more complicated system, just mm -hmm. like a real computer does with a motherboard, video card, etc. Now, in this example, you can see a simple fuse circuit to the left, mm -hmm. and this simple circuit um, uh, would allow students to learn how to build a circuit board if they've never built one before. Next is a full wave rectifier, which converts um, alternating current to the, uh, direct current. And this circuit is uh, critical to computer engineering, but it's also a core element in the IGCSE physics curriculum as well. And finally, the third component is a power stabilizer, which provides the computer with the correct current and voltage for the various components to operate. Now, while the physical structure of an ATX power supply is more complicated than these examples, the core theory of how and why it operates is exactly the same. And uh, the idea of computer engineering, if it interests you, uh, we will be happy to know uh, that we will be hosting another webinar later called um, Computer Engineering, Reimagining the Computer Science Curriculum which will go into these ideas in a lot more depth. Yes. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is making cross-curricular connections and how we can go beyond the project itself to make meaningful connections with the learning objectives of the core subject areas, specifically your math and science classes as these are the major pillars of STEM education. Now, this example has been taken directly out of a physics textbook. And this generally is what is taught most of the time, electronics from a completely theoretical standpoint. 
But these kinds of learning examples are normally void of any form of experimentation. And when we look at building a practical electrical engineering or STEM program, we really want to start tapping into theory that the students have already learned. And we do this by making lessons that apply that theory in context by solving real world problems. So in the next slide, uh, we'll look at some examples of different circuit experiments that apply these theories in a practical experiment. Uh, the circuit in the middle here um, allows us to look at the change in resistance through a circuit and how that affects voltage. And the other two examples are actually math puzzles that would require students to solve a system and then check the results by building the circuit and then using the appropriate lab equipment to take readings and validate the results. Thank you very much for this very, again, creative and innovative and very detailed answer. My next question will be, as you can see, most schools today, Mr. Campbell, are trying to reach the apex, you know, of horizontal integration between different subjects. How can implementing, implementing a practical electrical engineering program help ease the journey towards this crucial benchmark? Well, I, I think it's important to think of STEM integration in terms of horizontal alignment, as you've indicated, rather than vertical alignment, which is common in most content areas. I know some people may disagree with me on this idea, but let me explain. I don't think anyone would dispute the fact that STEM is very different than your core subject areas. So we need to approach it differently than subjects like English, math, or even science. Moreover, there's no standardized framework for STEM, and part of this is due to how broad STEM education is. And to be perfectly honest, there will probably never be a standardized STEM framework as programs will vary significantly from school to school based on their facilities, teacher expertise, local market demands, and the available budgets that the schools have available to them to run these programs. As such, this will result in vastly different programs developing at different schools. And in all honesty, this should be the case. So if schools are trying to develop vertical alignment in a STEM curriculum, uh, when there is no standardized framework, you will start running into issues. For instance, what happens when a student transfers in and out of a particular program? Therefore, STEM curriculum should look at horizontal integration with subjects that do have a relatively universal standard framework. Take math, for example. Every country in the world teaches addition first, followed by subtraction, multiplication and division, brackets, and then indices. So if we develop STEM curriculums that utilize what students are learning in their core subject areas and place that theory into context, then we can develop specialty STEM programs that are much more feasible for schools to implement. And what I mean by that is that schools can develop STEM programs that apply theory and knowledge in ways that focus on regional market needs while also offering long-term stability, i.e. the program can practically develop within the operational constraints of a particular school, such as the school size, the number of facilities available, teacher expertise, and finances available to run the program, et cetera. And you can probably see this approach in the previous um, circuit uh, examples that I've shown you already. You don't need years of vertical alignment learning circuitry to jump into any of these projects. Instead, these projects capitalize on years of vertical alignment within the core subject areas while requiring students to apply that theory in a meaningful way with little to no prerequisite skills, skill development. That means that students can engage with STEM activities at the higher grade levels, even if they've just transferred into a school. And that's why I think we really need to focus on horizontal alignment in STEM so that we capitalize on years of vertical alignment uh, years of vertical alignment in the core subject areas, um, such as math and science, rather than trying to look at ways to develop K through 12 alignment in STEM, which can create a whole slew of other problems, which will become more difficult as you get into the higher grade levels. Um, so here I have one more example, which will sh show how horizontal integration with other subject areas can work. And this video really shows um, the students getting into the physics physics curriculum, uh, but also the computer science and design technology programs as well, while also developing the students' dictation skills in their second language. Now, in this video, you'll see that these students are designing, um, uh, explaining the design of their own computer logic gates. And for reference, all three examples are exclusive or logic gates, but each project has been created using a very different method. And while you also probably notice that they're using multiple, multiple modular circuits in this experiment as well, so let's take a look at what these students have done. And I do want you to keep in mind that these are ESL students. So their English is probably not that, it's, it's not perfect. Um, however, they did do a great job of explaining complex ideas, especially considering that some of them have only been learning English for one or two years now. Uh, let me show you the mm. Yes, the uh, uh, is 
Mm, only A or B is on. The, uh, the LED will light, but uh, it, it won't work uh, both A and B. This is my XOR gate. I want to introduce the uh, uh, the power the tabs. The, as we can see, we have the two line and the one underground line. So if the power is two, only one power is through here, through the uh, yellow line and to to the resistor and through to this one, the lights through the lights and the power goes goes here. Uh, goes through to here and here and uh, through through to the ground and another power if you go uh, we can go to the orange orange line and also need to through the <coughs> through the resistor resistor and through the light and go to the and go to the ground but we cannot we can but we cannot through the two power together. If the two powers through the line and through the line together, the the light will not 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 bright. Let's have the explain. Put the light. This is how it works. Like this. And the power B is it's okay. It's okay. So if the two powers are together, the lights will not be bright. That's it. Uh, my gate is a four gate. When the input A is on, the power will go through the yellow line and the light is on. Same as A. If input B is on, the power will go through the orange line and the light is on too. If both inputs are on, the power will go through here and downwards to the ground, so the light is off. So as you just saw, all of these students built an exclusive OR gate using different approaches. And in this project, they've applied advanced theories in computer science while also integrating numerous theories that they've learned in physics as well. And uh, this was actually the first time that these students had ever made a circuit was in this class. So they started by building the simple fuse circuit, like what you saw in the modular ATX power supply project earlier. And then they progressed through a series of different circuit experiments, which all interconnected with one another to create a more complex experiment like what you've seen here. So while it may not have been self-evident as to why I recommended using prototype boards early in the presentation, I'm sure you're starting to see the value now. But it really comes down to looking ahead and planning for things that we want to undertake in the future, while also planning a logical sequence of work that will help us achieve those outcomes. And uh, that's the premise of backward design module within curriculum, de uh, curriculum design. Uh and with that being said, our next topic is the induction, uh, introduction of computer-aided design. So let's take a look at how we can help our students transition from physical circuits to creating advanced computerized simulations. So here we have a 10-year-old student, and normally I wouldn't recommend trying to teach uh, these kinds of concepts to a child of this age. However, I've been tutoring this student for a number of years, and his mother really wanted some challenging projects for him to undertake during the initial COVID lockdown. So here you can see some photos that his mother took of him uh, making this USB cell phone charger in the, in the kitchen. And she was immensely proud of what her son had done. And she made this post saying that one day her son would go on to become an electrical engineer. Um, now, uh, this is actually one of the most popular projects that I've designed over the years. Um, and there's several different uh, level project designs available, uh, which makes it easy for teachers to provide differentiation as well. Uh, as you can see with the examples over on the left, um, there, there's several different ways to build the circuit. Um, so you have variations of the same project that all your students will be able to achieve the same lear desired learning outcomes while having the ability to select a, a design that suits their particular skill level. 
And if you're interested in what um, other people think of this project, um, I also have some comments here that have been made from different educators about this project. And this is just one of hundreds of circuit projects that tie into different aspects of the um, uh, curriculum that we've designed and made available on Sino Exchange. Now, I've already shown these two examples before, uh, but here we have a breadboard to the left and a prototype board to the right. Now, I'd like you to think about which one of these designs would be easier for a student to recreate using a CAD program and why this would be. So I'll give you a moment to think about your response and maybe you can also share your thoughts in the chat box as well. And while you do that, I think John also has another question that he wants to ask. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you again. As uh, you uh, proved to us, uh, and we know that we can state bluntly today that STEM, STEAM education is the main generator and catalyzer of horizontal integration. It will help us reach to, do, to have the apex of horizontal integration. My next question would be, when we say ECAD, Mr. Campbell, what do we really mean by ECAD? And is it straightforward to integrate it within this innovative and revolutionary ethical pedagogical methodology? Uh, yeah, so ECAD is just computer-aided design for electronics mm -hmm. uh, because electronics is a unique area of specialization. So we need to use a CAD program that can support our specific needs. So a lot of educators that I've talked to have asked me why I hardly use breadboards when teaching high school students electrical engineering. And as I illustrated earlier in this presentation, breadboards require students to make a lot of abstract connections, which only complicates things for someone learning circuitry for the first time. However, there's another more important reason why I opt uh, to focus on the use of prototype boards instead. And this is because developing a STEM program is really like playing a game of chess. You need to think five or six moves ahead. And this is the reason why I've taken the time to have students develop circuits using the prototype board method instead of breadboards. Because I'm thinking about what I want to accomplish and what do I need to do to make future learning outcomes easier for my students uh, to acquire down the line. So as you can see in this example, the layout of the prototype board is identical to what it looks like if you design the circuit using a CAD program. And this is, in essence, makes it incredibly easy for students to transition from a physical circuit board design to a computer design in a matter, mat, matter of moments. And finally, the use of prototype boards also results in students creating a low cost project that they can take home and show their parents and potentially keep for years to come. Now, again, this is that 10 year old student learning how to use a CAD program to recreate the circuit on, on the computer. He's referencing his original circuit in order to recreate it on the computer. And you can see it on the computer, um, the keyboard there. And he's never used a CAD program before. Uh, this is actually his very first time designing something using the computer. And you can see that in a matter of minutes, he's actually already designing something using a professional grade CAD program. Now, if you're interested in some recommendations, uh, this program is iCircuit, which is an incredibly powerful program that only costs a few dollars to buy online. But you can also use circuitlab.com as well, which is another great low cost option. And this idea leads into, um, can lead into other ideas as well. Now, I actually really like to use this circuit when teaching students how to design a circuit on the computer, as it's the easiest A-stable multi-vibrated circuit that you can make. Now, for reference, this kind of circuit is what you would use to create a flashing lights for something like a railroad crossing or even a school stop bus sign. So I would have the students build and test the circuit and then recreate it in a CAD program. And this is because the lights will um, oscillate automatically, which makes it a great circuit to simulate on the computer. So here we have another student project. And again, the student had never used a CAD program in their life before for attempting this project. Now this project was done in Circuit Lab, which you can use uh, for free for this kind of activity. So you don't need to spend lots of money to do this kind of project with your students. And another thing that I um, like to do is have the students record their work um, so that I can see every mistake that they made and what they did to fix their own problems. And I think this process of self-revision -re is incredibly important for both teachers, um, for teaching and learning, I should say. Now this project took about one hour to do, and of course the students sped up the recording, but this, that means that in just one minute, I can see the entire learning process from start to finish, which provides me with an excellent tool to provide both formative and summative assessment of the project.
My uh, excellent answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. My next question will be, is it, uh, it is evident for all of us now that your creative approach is a significant catalyzer to nurture the 21st century lifelong learning traits within the students and reinforce and strengthen the needed real life based education. Can you please specify to our attendees the different elements needed to activate this catalyzer? Yeah, so high quality projects that link into the core curriculum are key to reinforcing and strengthening a student's understanding. By providing students with examples of how, they, um, how theory can be used in a real life context, students are empowered with the foresight that they need to understand where their education can lead them in the future, thus helping students to pursue a path of lifelong learning. And in a moment, uh, I will model what this could look like. Um, that way I can give you an idea of how theory can be applied to projects that demonstrate the real world application of theoretical science. Uh, because at the end of the day, we don't really want concepts to remain as abstract ideas. We wanna look at ways that we can reinforce the core curriculum by, by placing it into an appropriate context that makes it relevant. So at this point, I'm gonna model a lesson for you so you can see how projects and theory can be intertwined. In this example, I'm gonna look at how we can convert wind energy into electrical electricity using a rectifier circuit. In this example, we'll cover ideas from numerous different courses such as social studies, geography, physics, science, design technology, and electronics. So there's so many different connections that can be made in a project like this. So let's take a look at how we can use guided inquiry-based learning to help students develop a deeper understanding of uh, core theories and how those theories can be applied in context to solve a real world problem. So we definitely need to start by building foundations. And that's what I'm gonna start with right here. Now we need our wind turbine to uh, produce a five volt, uh, sta a stable five volt output. And a five volt direct current would look like this, basically a straight line over time. But wind turbines use an alternator to produce power and that creates an alternating current. But an alternating current starts at zero volts. It then increases to its maximum positive amplitude mm -hmm and then starts decreasing to reach its minimum negative amplitude before returning to a value of zero again. So what would this look like if we graphed it using the same template as before? Now give your students a moment to think about the answers before showing it to them. So a five volt alternating current would look like this. Okay, it's a sinusoidal function for those of you who teach grade 11 math, but essentially this is what we get from an electric turbine. And we also need a number of vocabulary terms here that, um, so that we, can, uh, that we can introduce to students so that they can understand how to properly des describe a sine wave. These in terms would include the crest, which is the maximum positive amplitude, the trough, which is the uh, minimum negative amplitude, the wavelength, which is the distance from one crest to the next. And we have the ampli um, amplitude, which is uh, amplitude of the wave, which is basically the measurement from the midpoint to the highest or lowest point in the waveform. And these are all terms that are important re to review in the physics curriculum but they also get used in music as well. So what we essentially need at this time is a circuit that can solve this problem for us. That is to change an alternating current such as this to a direct current like this. So there, uh, these are all common electrical symbols that you'll find in the physics and design technology curriculums. We have a diode, capacitor, resistor, PMP tra uh, transistor, ground, and an MPN transistor. So rather than just giving my students the answer, I would guide them towards discovering the answers for themselves. Now, before I move on, what component do you think that we could use? And what evidence do you have to support your answer? Again, our objective here is to find a way to convert alternating current to a direct current. And one of these components has the ability to do that for us. Now, if you don't know the answer, don't worry. Uh, the main idea here is to help give your students the, an opportunity to develop ideas and to try to support those ideas with evidence which really helps to give, get a two-way dialogue occurring in our classes. Now, the correct answer to this question is the diode. And the reason for this is that a diode only allows power to flow through it in one direction. So by using a diode, we can limit the direction that the power flows in a circuit to one direction only. This will eliminate the negative duty cycle of an alternating current. So to put it another way, only the positive part of the duty cycle, that is the part of the sine wave that's above zero volts, will be allowed to flow through the circuit. And as a teacher, I recommend that you try phrasing things in several different ways to really emphasize some, some of those key ideas. And this is because repetition is incredibly helpful to students as they try to remember new concepts. Therefore, 
Therefore, rephrasing and repeating the same idea more than once will help give your students more opportunities to absorb those big ideas. Now, I'd like to give you a task. Uh, so what do you think a five volt alternating current would look like if a diode was inserted into the circuit? Again, give your students a moment to try to come up with a solution on their own. Now, as a teacher, you could have your students draw the graph in their notebook, provide them with handouts, or you could even ask everyone in the class to draw the graph using their finger in the air. Then as a teacher, I could instantly see how many of the students were able to predict the results accurately, which is a quick and easy way to perform an assessment for learning in the middle of a lesson. And the correct solution is this. Um, so the output of the half-wave rectifier, um, we still have the positive duty cycle and the negative duty cycle has essentially been eliminated by that di diode. So what would this look like in a computer simulation? So in the short animation, we'll have an alternating power, power source that I've slowed down to one hertz so that we can see what's happening with the electrons. Uh, next, we have a transformer, which is, uh, will basically reduce the 240 volt power supply to a 12 volt, um, 12 volts for our class projects. And this is really so that we're working with low voltage power supplies, which is much safer for our students to work with. So in the circuit, we have power coming from the transformer through a single diode and then through a light before returning to the transformer. All right, now that we understand the layout of the circuit diagram, let's run the simulation to see what happens. So you can see the yellow electrons flowing through the circuit. And basically what's happening is the LED light is flashing once every second. Now this is a circuit that's known as a half-wave rectifier, and it is a topic that's covered in the IGCSE physics curriculum. So what's wrong with a half-wave rectifier? Well, we don't really want the lights in our house flashing or the power to our TV turning on and off automatically. So it's evident that this circuit isn't really a viable solution to our problem. What we want is to take the alternating current from our wind turbine and convert it into a stable and reliable power source. So what we have right now is just part of a solution, but we don't have a complete solution yet. Therefore, we need to redefine our project. And this is a big part of STEM education, coming up with an idea, testing a hypothesis, and then evaluating the effectiveness of our design. Then we find ways to improve upon our original concepts so that we can continually advance our designs. And this is exactly what engineers do in the real world, design, test, and rebuild. So the problem with that half-wave rectifier is the power is only supplied to the load when the power cycle is positive. That is when the part of the sine wave is above zero volts. And this means that the power is being turned on and off at regular intervals, which results in the light flashing. Now to fix this problem, we need a specialized circuit that's known as a full wave rectifier. And again, this is a concept that's covered in the physics curriculum, but full wave rectifiers are a bit more complicated. So in this circuit diagram for a full wave rectifier, um, it kind of looks like a traffic circle and it essentially works in the same way. That's because electrons can only flow in one direction, just like cars can only drive in one direction when, they're on, when they enter a traffic circle. So this circuit basically results in the electrons flowing through the circuit in the same direction. Now, what did you notice about the LED light? So you might have noticed that the LED light is still flashing, but the time that the light is off is much shorter than it was before. And this is because there's now two paths for the electricity to flow through in order to get to the main circuit loop. And this means that when the power cycle is positive, the electricity will flow through the full wave rectifier in one direction, and when the power cycle is negative, the electricity will flow through the uh, full wave rectifier in the opposite direction. So in other words, the negative part of the sine wave will be inverted, but there's still a rising and falling action occurring in the supply of power. So I'd like, to give you, um, I'd like you to take a moment to think about how we would graph this. So again, using that same graph te template as we used before, try to graph what a revised sinusoidal function would look like. Now, again, give your students a chance to do this on their own before showing them the, the correct results. And you can do this with your finger on the camera, um, just as you could do with your students. So you have your students come up with an idea, just as I am on the webcam. And once you've had a chance to see what your students have thought about, give them the answer. Now, this is the final waveform, um, or this is what the final waveform would look like. Uh, we've inverted the negative parts of the duty cycle, which makes it positive. However, we still have a rising and falling action. And as you can see, there are momentary points in which the power drops to zero. And that's why the LED is still flashing. So there is a way to fix this problem and it's not overly difficult. 
Essentially, all we need to do is add a capacitor to the circuit in parallel to the load. Otherwise, the circuit is exactly the same as before. So what do you predict to happen when you add the capacitor to the full wave rectifier circuit? And I would also like you to try to justify your answer if possible. Now, hopefully you have an idea of what's gonna happen, but if you uh, don't, um, don't worry, uh, because we're gonna watch a simulation of the circuit together. So right now you can see the flow of electrons through the, uh, through the circuit, and we can see the values entering and exiting the capacitor are changing rapidly. And this is because the capacitor is charging and discharging as the potential difference in the circuit changes. So a capacitor is kind of like a battery. When the power cycle is high, the capacitor will start charging and storing power, and the power, and when the power cycle is low, the capacitor will start discharging that power. And this releases power back to the rest of the circuit. Therefore, that capacitor is providing power to the LED when the power used to drop to zero volts. Now, I really want you to analyze everything that's happening in the circuit before we move on. There are still moments where there's no electrons flowing through this full wave rectifier. However, the LED remains on at all time. And this is because the capacitor is powering the rest of the circuit during those moments that the flow of electrons are changing direction before entering the rectifier. So finally, we have a usable circuit design that we can use for our wind turbine. And once more, I'd like you to try graphing the final output of the circuit. And this will be our last graphing activity that we do to get together. All right, so you might have drawn a straight line. However, the correct answer should look like this there will still be minuscule fluctuations in power as the capacitor charges and discharges. However, these fluctuations will be so small that the average electro electronic device will not be affected by these changes. Um, as these variations will be within the acceptable tolerance range, therefore in practice, we finally have a usable direct current power source. Now to put into a practical project, uh, here we have an oscilloscope, which is used to analyze waveforms and a series of circuit board projects. So the first image is basically just the oscilloscope plugged into an alternating power supply, followed by an experiment that allows the students to do a comparative analysis between a half wave and a full wave rectifier. And finally, the third image shows a full wave rectifier with a high capacity capacitor, which has, been give, which has given us a perfect DC output. So in these examples, you can see that we're no longer just looking at things from a theoretical standpoint, but we're actually applying the core theories in context to solve a real world problem. So if we look at the type of horizontal integration with these kinds of STEM projects, we can see that a single project can address a large number of learning outcomes. For instance, these are all the aspects of the IGCSC physics curriculum that would be covered by this one project. Now here you can see um, one of the projects uh, sheets that you can um, download from Sino Exchange that shows you how to build these kinds of circuits. This particular example is a three phase rectifier, which we haven't actually covered yet. However, in this circuit, we're actually rectifying three different sinusoidal functions that are offset by a phase shift of 120 degrees each. And this provides us with an even better power output, which is evident by the data provided in the company graphs. But as you can see, this one project is able to target so many different learning standards. And these are just the standards from the physics curriculum alone. And then you have, you can start thinking about environmental sustainability and social impact standards from the human geography curriculum, et cetera. And so we have one project that might be able to tie into every single subject that the student might be taking in a given year. Moreover, this project is just one of many projects that we've designed around sustainable energy solutions and smart home technologies. So I'm gonna show you another student video from a group of three girls. And this actually brings me to another idea. What can we do as educators to encourage uh, and support more girls to pursue a career in STEM? <laughs> Thank you. 
So in this video, we saw these three girls making circuits that could be used in a variety of smart home applications. The first circuit is similar to what you would see in the LED lights, which allow you to toggle between a high and low setting or a warm and cool color temperature. The second was a home security alarm that would beep if someone enters a room or if a window was open. And finally, the th third circuit was a fire alarm. And we have the templates uh, that can help you build these circuits for yourself. But because these are all based on the use of prototype boards, you can customize any of these circuits. And this allows you to simplify projects or even add additional layers of complexity. And this provides your students with scaffolded support, which will help them excel while also providing methods for differentiation at the same time. So at this point, you're probably wondering what do you need to get started? Or you might be thinking that this is gonna be super expensive, but in reality, it's not. After all, in all of those videos, you probably haven't seen many tools. So right now we'll take a look at the tools and equipment that you'll need to get your program off the ground. So you definitely need the following three tools. Now, I don't recommend buying toolkits because you tend to get a lot of things that you don't need, and the quality of tools and pre-made kits are usually not that great either. So I recommend buying just the tools that you need. And having fewer tools makes it easier for students to learn what to use, when to use it, and how to use it properly. So starting from the left, you'll need a pair of 45 degree pliers that are designed for cutting wires. And I would recommend buying the five inch instead of the six inch with students, just because their hands are usually a little bit smaller. Next, you'll need, to, uh, uh, you'll need 20 to 30 gauge wire strippers. And again, wire strippers come in um, several different sizes. So you want the size that's designed for smaller wires and not large high voltage wires. And finally, 45 degree precision tweezers. Um, and, these are the, and these tools are not overly expensive. For instance, the most expensive item here are the wire strippers, and these only cost about $12 US or about $100 or 100 RMB, I should say, if you're buying them uh, here in China. Uh, next, you'll need soldering irons, and there's a few different types of soldering irons that you can buy. Uh, the higher end units on the left have adjustable temperature controls and replaceable chips, which are incredibly useful. Um, next, uh, the small USB soldering irons on the right are great choices for school electronic programs, and I really like using this type of soldering iron for a few reasons. First, they do not get overly hot, which reduces the chance that students will damage sensitive IC chips by overheating them. Next, they draw power from a student's computer or from a portable battery pack, and this can reduce how many extension cords you need, use, uh, use, need to use during your lessons. And finally, they're incredibly inexpensive. So I often uh, use them as a consumable item, giving every student their own soldering iron at the start of the, uh, the term, which they're then responsible for the, for the rest of the year. And then the one in the middle, uh, which is the typical soldering iron that most people would buy in, uh, instinctively. Uh, regrettably, these are actually the worst possible soldering irons that you can buy for educational purposes. They have large tips, which are not suitable for precision electronics. They get far too hot and can damage your components. And due to the high temperatures, the tips quickly oxidize. And this makes it more difficult for your students to use. So my recommendation is don't buy this type of soldering iron because they're not designed for microcircuitry. They're designed for high voltage industrial applications which your students are not gonna be doing in class. Uh, the next set of items you'll need to keep things organized uh, while addressing safety concerns. So the first item is an inexpensive desk uh, organizer from Delhi. And I really like this particular item as it's the perfect size to hold the tools in the back section, a roll of wires and solder in the front, and the helping hands unit where you see the notepad. Therefore, you can have a completely self-contained kit which you can store in a locker with everything a student needs to build their circuits. Then a student can easily grab a complete kit at the start of class and then return that kit at the end of class, making it easy for the teacher to manage everything that's going on. The next item is a blue soldering mat. Now this is a heat resistant silicone mat and a simple A4 sized mat is sufficient. Um, uh, now these mats, they do not conduct electricity. Uh, they have places to store par loose parts when you're working on your circuit design and they can withstand prolonged exposure from heat from a soldering iron. These mats are not expensive uh, and they will protect your workspace. They can even help prevent a fire if students forget to unplug their soldering iron, which is something that can easily happen during a fire or a lockdown drill. So I'm not sure why a lot of schools don't buy these safety mats, 
because they're not expensive and they can make a huge difference. And finally, we have helping hands. Uh, and these are a must have item. Helping hands hold your circuit boards while you're working on them. And this keeps your hands away from the hot end of the soldering iron, which reduces your chances of getting burned. So you only really need four tools, a safety mat and a desk organizer to start an electrical engineering program at your school. The last item you might wanna consider is a good multimeter. And this will be, uh, become an important uh, tool when you start taking readings and analyzing data from your experiment. However, there's so many options on the market. And it, so it can be really hard to choose a good meter for your program. So here I'm showing two models that look very similar while being very different at the same time. Now, I'd like you to take a moment to think about which one of these meters you would buy for your school and why. Which one do you think is better? And which one do you think is more advanced? And I'll just pause here for a moment and uh, maybe we can get a few responses in the chat uh, before I move on. The one on the right. All right, the so we have them that, that like the one on the right. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any other ideas? So far, the, the right is the prevailing yeah. one? Yes, yes. All right, so I'll continue on and um, you can still uh, pop your answer into the chat uh, while I continue on. Uh, but not all meters are made equal and looks can be deceiving. Now, the one on the right is what a lot of people would indicate uh, that they would buy. And it's also what I see in most schools as well. It looks more advanced. After all, it has more settings. But in my opinion, this is one of the worst types of meters you can buy for education. And this is because looks can be deceiving. With this kind of meter, you need to know exactly what values you're expected, uh, you expect your test, um, that you expect from your test and manually set the range of, of meter. And as a teacher, you'll likely tell your students to set your meters to a particular setting, but your students will ask why, and you'll likely respond, just because that's the setting we need to use. However, if I already know what the values I'm expecting from the test are, then I wouldn't be testing the values in the first place. Moreover, if the meter is set wrong, the consequences can be deadly. For instance, I might have the meter set to a low voltage range while testing high voltage wires. As a result, the meter will often show zero volts because the actual value is at a range. And this can result in students misassessing the situation and working on a live circuit. Mm. Therefore, these meters are particularly bad for education because they're, they're overly complicated, making it difficult for the students to use independently. And the lack of auto ranging can result in avoidable mistakes, which could lead to either injury or even death. However, the meter on the left is actually far superior and it's the one that's used by most professionals. While this meter looks simple, it's actually a state-of-the-art auto ranging multimeter. This means that the meter will, is sophisticated enough to identify the appropriate range of what's being tested and set the scale accordingly to provide the operator with precise results. As a result, this meter will be significantly easier for students to learn how to use while also being much safer. Moreover, professional brands like Fluke will provide many years of reliable service, making the investment worthwhile. Now I've used numerous multimeters over the years and most of them don't even last the year. However, I've never had to replace a fluke meter in more uh, once in the 10 years of teaching electronics. So although they are a little expensive, they are absolutely worth the investment. Really, thank you very much for this detailed, detailed infrastructural explanation, Mr. Campbell. Uh, my next question will be now, uh, I can see that all our attendees, our colleagues are ready and enthusiastic to start this needed innovative groundbreaking journey of practical electrical engineering program within STEM education. And they eliminated the illusion that they need a lot of financial resources to start this journey. Can you please summarize for them the different milestones they need to follow and establish to generate this crucial pedagogical roadmap? Right, uh, well, to um, uh, help you out, um, and as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, do-it-yourself kits tend to become very costly and tend to lack any associated methodology that would help students develop a deeper understanding as to how or why the circuit works. Therefore, the use of prototype boards provides a superior solution for educators. 
However, this means that educators need to develop circuit designs that are aligned to the core curriculum while also um, reasonable to expect that a student can attempt on their own. Now, typically this has been the limiting factor that has made development of practical and cost-effective electrical engineering programs a fantasy for most schools. However, that is about to change. Uh, Sino Exchange has already released over 100 circuit experiments that the uh, general mm -hmm. public um, can, can download. And all of this we've made available completely free of charge. Uh, moreover, we've designed all of our projects to use the fewest number of base components to make it easier for you to maintain an inventory of key electrical components. And this allows you to buy parts in bulk uh, so you can keep your costs down. Uh, however, since we are a charitable in, uh, organization, we don't actually sell any educational kits ourselves, but we have provided you to links to third-party suppliers to help you get started. Now, these are only referrals, so it's not like you're obligated to use these uh, companies. Uh, it's just companies that we have used and we've developed a tr uh, trust relationship with. Um, but I still would recommend that teachers kind of vet companies for their, themselves, especially if they're in different geographic regions. Um, the supplier that I have recommended here is uh, for, for all of China. But if you're in the Middle East or Europe, you might need to find a different supplier. Uh, but over on the left, um, you actually see this is a screenshot from our website here. Um, and we basically tell you all of the different parts that you would need for any of our circuit experiments. We explain what the part is, and then we provide you a link to a supplier. Uh, and over here on the right, um, actually have one of those um, pages up. And so here you can see that this is 1,000 LED lights for only 22 RMB. And that's about $3 US for 1,000 LED lights. So you can start seeing if you are actually buying in bulk uh, that you can actually really keep the cost down quite a bit. Um, so um, this is the website here, sinoexchange.org. Um, and I'll just give you a moment to jot that website uh, URL down. And then I'm just gonna close the PPT for a moment uh, and actually show you the website, show you where to find those resources, uh, how to download them, et cetera. Uh, and then I'll come back to the presentation again. Yeah. And please, can you tell us more about uh, where this website, uh, the, the dream that came true, the sign of exchange, this dream that came true, please tell us more about this nonprofit organization in which you're helping a lot of scholars in China and worldwide in this great journey of education? Uh, yeah, um, so I'll get to, uh, give me a moment uh, for that question mm -hmm. and um, I'll just um, show the participants um, where yes. they can download things and then come to, to that there. Uh, so this is our website right here. Um, so this is actually all of our um, founding members right here uh, who all volunteer their time to help build and design all of these resources. Um, but under resources, uh, there's a whole section uh, called circuit design. Um, and in this section, we have uh, everything is available bilingual, English and Chinese, which makes uh, teaching, uh, particularly in China, much easier uh, with photographic examples and then also links to all sorts of different experiments and also resource guides. Um, so uh, right here, this is ordering electrical components. So if you uh, need to uh, get the components that to start off. Um, here's a list of all of the components uh, that uh, all, all of our experiments use. And we've actually designed everything to use the fewest number of possible components possible. Um, so you can see out of this list, there's not actually a lot here. And out of this list, we have over a hundred different experiments and we have more coming all the time. Um, so uh, here, this here, um, is one of the projects for DC motor control circuits or H bridges. And this is actually a core component of robotics curriculums uh, because the DC motor control circuits allow us to control uh, robots on the direction that they move, et cetera. Uh, we have explanations onto the theory, explaining how things work, uh, going from simple designs and then um, scaffolding up towards more complex designs such as these diode based um, uh, H bridges, video simulations to show you how things are working. Uh, and then these are all of the different circuit designs um, for um, H-bridges that you can download. Uh, you can open them up or you can just download them to your computer and then print them out. Um, as for um, computer science, um, so we have a whole bunch of series on logic gates. And so here we actually see uh, that exclusive OR project that I was talking about early in the presentation. Um, this is actually the structure of an exclusive OR gate when we look at it as uh, function diagrams and then comparing and contrasting that to the electrical schematics. And what the students had actually done in that project was uh, they actually took that schematic, 
which is quite complicated. And they found alternative mo uh, methods to simplify that. Um, and there's that same video. And again, you can download the reference material. Um, it's taken a little while to open that, yeah. but basically uh, well, you would just go here and then click the download and you could download and print it to your, as yourself. Um, and then there's that USB cell phone charger project um, with step-by-step um, -step video tutorial guides. Um, and then to download the resources, just click on the link. Um, and I think my internet connection is bad right now. That's probably okay. why things aren't loading okay. well. Um, so uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, there's no subscriptions you need. There's no fees. There's no advertising. Um, it's what we've designed is a platform that's completely free and open to really help eliminate those social and economic barriers uh, that a lot of students uh, face when, when looking at particularly STEM education, which is typically quite expensive. Um, so with uh, that's our website. Um, so I'm just going to go back to the PPT now, mm -hmm. um, as we have a few more slides left. Um, and um, so um, you had asked about um, Sino Exchange. Yes. Um, so Sino Exchange is really the first of its kind. Uh, while most ed tech companies are in it for the money, uh, Sino Exchange is centered around social impact and working towards the common good. So we've cr created a completely free and open platform. There's no subscriptions, no user fees, and no unwanted ads. Um, so we've created a platform that's truly accessible to anyone, regardless of their social or economic background. And this means that anyone can access educational resources to learn more about a topic that may interest them and embrace a journey of lifelong learning. Great, great, great. Uh, my uh, uh, other question, what prompted you uh, to found a not-for-profit edtech startup, Mr. Campbell? This dream that came true. Uh, well, while the central government's recent regulatory changes surrounding for-profit educational entities did correspond with the with our launch, uh, these regulatory changes had nothing to do with the founding of Sino Exchange. Um, I'd actually been working on the platform for several years before this announcement was even made. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, I rushed the release of this public platform so that I could help as many educators as I could um, who had been impacted by these changes. But the real reason be behind developing this platform was that I truly believe that education is the right of all individuals and not just those who can afford the best opportunities in life. So what I really wanted to do was to create something that could, could help individuals who may possess great potential, but may not have the means to reach it, to really give back to a community that's given me so many opportunities over the years. As such, it's my hope and it's my belief that every member in society, if given the opportunity to become the best version of their, themselves, that society will prosper and in turn, that everyone will prosper. So in es essence, by acting in the best interest of others, in society as a whole, we're essentially acting in our own best interests as well. And I think that's at the, what's at the heart of the Chinese dream. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely, it's what's at the heart of my dream as well. So how can, great, thank you, really, uh, a role model uh, missionary of the state mission education, Mr. Campbell, how can Sino Exchange afford to operate if you provided all of this services to users all over China and worldwide? And even to all the world, if you don't change, if you don't charge anyone anything to use your platform and to access your educational resources. Um, yeah. Um, so this all really started kind of many years ago when I wanted to do more than just teach a handful of students at the same time. Uh, and like many enthusiastic teachers, I thought that pursuing a master's degree would give me the tools that I would need to make a greater impact on teaching and learning. And after a consider. Uh, careful consideration, I ended up doing a master's of business administration while focusing on educational management. As such, I spent six years completing my master's, and during that time, I wrote hundreds of papers and spent over 24,000 pounds on my education. But when it was all said and done, I had accomplished nothing of real value. I'd spent six years of my life doing nothing more than take, talking about what could be done, but never actually taking actions to be towards making my beliefs a reality. So when I had to think about what I should do next, I thought really long and hard before pursuing a doctoral degree. And eventually I decided that I was done wasting my time talking about change. I wanted to be the change that I had imagined. So I took the money that I would have spent on my doctoral program and I put it towards founding Sino Exchange. I bought the servers, the hosting solutions and prepaid the necessary internet bandwidth to allow the organization to operate for several years. 
I made all of the necessary commitments that would uh, be needed to give the organization a fighting chance, because all I really needed to do was develop a movement that would inspire a grassroots following that would nurture the continued growth of the platform into the future. So as long as I can nurture this idea long enough to reach a critical mass, then there'd be hope for it to continue to grow and prosper on its own. So in essence, Sino Exchange is my grand ex uh, experiment to see if doing good can also be good business. Now, I don't exactly know what the future has in store for a completely not-for-profit charitable organization, but I am optimistic that there's enough selfless people out there that, um, that will help us make a real difference to those who are in need. Outstanding. Um, and I see there's a question from uh, Dr. Ying as well. Yes, um, so yes. I might as well uh, yeah. jump on, on that uh, before moving on. Uh, so you're what is the main you're challenge um, you're facing in China um, if we like to develop project-based learning for schools in rural areas? Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely a number of, of problems that are, are unique to China, um, and not to even to China, but globally is the shortage of STEM professionals. Uh, that's definitely a global issue. Uh, but then when we look at China, um, we also have a huge language barrier. Um, and that makes it really hard, particularly for a lot of English speaking STEM experts, because America is really kind of the, America founded STEM education, and then it kind of pushed out into other English speaking countries like Canada, Australia, etc. So a lot of the STEM sp uh, specialists are going to be English first language speakers. Um, and then, of course, other nations have adopted STEM um, after the, after the fact, uh, but it's really difficult for a lot of non-Chinese speakers to be able to really implement um, uh, it, these types of projects because of, of, of the language barrier. Uh, definitely because of the hands-on approach, we can model things and that helps a little bit, um, but uh, language does come into a, a huge effect. And that's part of the reason why we've actually looked at developing a completely bilingual uh, resource package um, so that we can basically uh, take a look at developing the student's second language while still also understanding and respecting their first language. And this really kind of ties into um, cognitive language development theory by John Biggs, um, who is a leading um, uh, proponent on ESL theory. Um, so he talks a lot about basic intercommunication skills and cognitive academic language skills in his 2001 paper on English literacy development, where he talks about the best way to develop a student's second language is to uh, capitalize on their understandings in their first language. Um, so I definitely really support this mentality, and that's why you'll see that um, I look at how I use the Chinese language support to develop their English language development um, by capitalizing what they already know in Chinese and then help transition that towards English. Uh, but that's really difficult to do unless you either speak Chinese or you have access to those bilingual resources. And that's uh, really kind of where a lot of our emphasis has been going into developing bilingual STEM education resources uh, and sharing those with the, the, the general public. Um, we also have the idea as well, um, Chinese, China has its own interpretation of STEM as well. Um, and this actually kind of aligns well with what the uh, World Economic Forum has indicated as well with what they recommend for changes to STEM uh, internationally. So China is kind of a, a bit of a ahead of the game on this, uh, but their interpretation of STEM is what they would call STEM plus Yu or moral education. Uh, and this really kind of comes into the aspect of going beyond just the project itself, but looking at the social and economic aspects mm -hmm. of the, you know, the individual, the role in society, um, and making sure that kind of our actions um, kind of support the development of good moral character development as well. Um, so this is kind of the Chinese interpretation of STEM, which is uh, again, uh, or moral education. Um, Everyone is asking Mr. Campbell, are you going to have more webinars regarding uh, this very outstanding STEM approach that you have? In general, uh, in the new yeah, um, yes, uh, it's, we've got uh, quite a few coming up. Um, 
So uh, if you found this webinar enlightening, uh, you may want to consider attending any of these upcoming webinars that are related to the development of high quality STEM programs. Um, all of these presentations will be equally as informative as this one, and will provide you with evidence-based examples and project modeling that will help you design your own STEM programs that will help prepare your students for the new global economy. And these webinars will include why there's no future in STEM and what we can do to fix the problem, developing a sustainable STEM program, and how to create a cost-effective program that focuses on developing core learning outcomes rather than a dependency on technology, computer engineering, reimagining the computer science curriculum, uh, computational algorithms, a visual exploration for non-programmers, applied math and physics in STEM, exploring the real-world applications of math and science in STEM education by using guided inquiry-based learning, and chemistry in STEM, exploring ways chemistry can be placed into various real-world contexts. Uh, so these are all upcoming um, pr uh, programs that will basically take a look at specific areas. Uh, we have dates for the first four, uh, but the other two uh, are to be yeah. Please, everyone, can you uh, be on uh, mute mode so we can listen to Mr. Campbell? Please. Yeah, go ahead, um, Mr. Campbell. So we have Thank another you. question. Um, how do we help nations without a deliberate STEM education program or policy? Um, and this is actually pretty much most countries, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so um, definitely what we really want to do is take a look at what is the true nature of STEM education? Why was it created? Um, and uh, we had to, this is something that I'm going to be talking about a lot in my next presentation, why there's no future in mm -hmm. STEM and what we can do to fix the problem. Um, because there's, uh, unfortunately, we've kind of lost sight of what STEM is supposed to be. Um, and uh, a leading uh, proponent uh, to uh, Chinese education, Feng, uh, indicated that STEM is only uh, interested in the project itself while kind of for missing or omitting the, the importance of the individual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this was um, uh, a criticism that Fung made of STEM education in 2017 uh, before the central government uh, brought in their nationwide plan for uh, a nationwide STEM program. And there's been lots of criticisms of STEM over the years um, for similar reasons, the World Economic Forum has indicated similar uh, concerns as well. And this is really kind of comes down to the problem of a lot of individuals not really understanding what STEM is supposed to be and just developing a very rudimentary understanding, uh, which tends to lead towards the uh, focusing on the hands-on parts of things, but not actually looking at the deeper understandings, the integration into the curriculum. Um, so uh, I definitely go into this in depth in the next presentation. Uh, and this is actually gonna be a, a longer webinar, uh, probably about three hours in length, mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, an hour, 45 minutes, because there's just so much to cover. Uh, but one thing that we really need to kind of look at is a, making sure that we are looking at designing projects that are gonna tie into the core curriculum, making sure that we are addressing real world needs, um, and then looking at really horizontal integration is definitely the best thing that we can do because if we don't have um, a program or policy K through 12, which to be honest, um, there isn't really a country that does have a K through 12 policy. Uh, and I don't think there's really a way that you can because of how broad STEM is. Um, the only way you can really make things viable is to look horizontally to the subjects that do have an, a national policy uh, and then use those for inspiration um, when designing projects. Um, so look to particularly your, your math and your science classes, because those are the two pillars uh, of STEM education. Um, actually, before STEM was even an acronym, uh, it was actually SMET was the first acronym. Um, and SMET does not sound very good, but the reason why they <clears throat> put it to STEM was that science and math were actually determined to be the two core pillars that supported everything else. Um, so, and math and science are quite standardized. So if we look horizontally towards those two subjects, look at what is expected at grade level for those two subjects, and then take a look at what can we do to put it into context to make it relevant. Um, and that's the best solution for, um, for any country, in my opinion, uh, for developing a STEM program. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Campbell. And that's why STEM, STEAM education is not just a new mindset or a new methodology. It is the essence and the core of the 21st century lifelong learning education. It's the main initiator of real life-based education. It's the magical wand that helps creating a student-centered differentiated facilitating learning classroom without borders. It's the reason to adopt one subject called knowledge. It's the simplifying pillar of differentiation. STEM STEAM is the present, the future of education, so that all our students and lifelong learners are apt for today and ready for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. And we have a lot of questions here, but I want to announce this, that we have another webinar on April 30 uh, with Mr. Cormac Davy. And you are more than welcome to this as of next week. You will have the link on our social media and you can uh, about formative assessment, more in depth formative assessment for next uh, April 30, which is going to be again on a Saturday at 6 p.m. China time and 2 p.m. Uh, Gulf time. Mr. Campbell, we have a lot, a lot of questions here. Thank you, attendees, for this outstanding webinar. Everyone's very, very happy. We have a lot, a lot of questions. Let's take the written one first. I have one here from Moses. How do you help nations without a deliberate STEM education program or policy? Well, uh, that's such, um, the question I just uh, answered uh, yes. just a moment ago. Yes, yes. Um, but um, I did. Uh, there was one that I missed from uh, Lasso uh, about uh, uh, in Africa. Can the supplier ship to Africa? Uh, yes. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, I'd have to check. Uh, but one thing um, that you can also do is there's that list of all of the parts on on the website. So you could basically just forward that entire list to a local supplier and say. Um, can you quote on, on this? And you could send it off to multiple suppliers within the African continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and it might actually be a little bit cheaper to, to use a local supplier um, than to have to do shipping import and export duties. Um, and that would definitely be something to look into, but at least with all of the designs on the website, uh, all of the, the project exemplars, you can download the projects um, that we have available and you can use those. We have a list of all the parts that you need. Um, and if you send that uh, list of parts off to a, an electronic supply, uh, supply company within your country, uh, they would definitely be able to um, quote you on how much the parts would cost. Um, and it might be a, a little bit more convenient dealing with a local company than, than a Chinese company, um, ex especially if you don't speak Chinese or can't read Chinese, um, it might be, be difficult. Um, so again, um, our, our main focus was to kind of bridge the gap between China and the West. So a lot of our services, the way that we've mm -hmm. structured it is to help um, educators uh, within the, the, the China, mainland China. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's restricted ch to China. Anyone could use our resources anywhere in the world. Um, and then potentially, depending on how much interest there is, maybe we can look at um, kind of expanding support to, to other countries. And I would be more than happy to, uh, you know, if you found a supplier in Africa or the Middle East that is recommended um, to make those referrals for other teachers uh, to make it easier for, for other people going forward. Yeah, another question to uh, Mr. Campbell, how can we become members of Sino Exchange and help Sino Exchange in its sacred and important journey? Uh, well, being that it's a completely free and open system, um, there's actually nothing that you need to do. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, just go to the website, sinoexchange.org, and that's it. Uh, we don't track our users' uh, information, we don't, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore we don't sell it or, or whatnot. Um, so it's completely free and open. Uh, there's no memberships, there's no um, login IDs, it's just completely free and open uh, to make it as easy as possible for, for anyone um, to, to access things. And this was done intentionally so that um, anyone, uh, regardless of their social or economic background, could have access to all of our resources. Uh, and it's really my hope that, you know, particularly the children of some of the migrant workers that are not in good financial situations, that you know, they could access these materials and you know, maybe become engineers um, and mm -hmm. really kind of break that cycle of poverty. Uh, and that's what I really hope to be able to do by, by having this platform completely free and open. 
Um, so there's nothing that you need to do other than just go to the website. Uh, it's completely free, completely open. And another question too, as we have, we have two more uh, attendees raise their hands and we'll give them time to ask questions too. Uh, another question from the chat box, are there exchange programs for educators to share good practice, especially in STEM? From Dennis? Uh, yeah. Um, so definitely with um, all of our materials, uh, right now there's five of us um, who are volunteering our, our time to develop these resources. And uh, definitely we would like to be able to grow the program over time. Um, so if you are interested, um, we know we'd be more than happy to have uh, additional volunteers come in and, and help develop and support curricula. Um, again, this would be uh, on a volunteer basis because uh, we are completely um, not for profit. We are a charity. So part of what, mm -hmm. in order to keep the cost down, um, we rely heavily on, um, we don't advertise because um, that would drive costs up. We um, mm -hmm. aren't, you know, spending money on things that a lot of uh, for-profit entities would. Um, so it's really kind of the, the entire platform is based off of the charity and goodwill of those people supporting it. And right now there, there's five of us. Um, but if there are other educators who are really good at curriculum design and they, uh, they want to you know, become part of the, the organization on a volunteer basis, um, you know, it'd be definitely, uh, you know, we, we would welcome the support. We, uh, and that's really how the program uh, platform is going to grow over time is by more and more educators coming together and, and sharing their passion for education. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. And again, thank you very much, dear attendees. And please stay with us. And uh, I see a lot of people raising their hands. So you will ask all your questions. Mr. Cameron will stay with us half an hour or more. Well, no problem. He's, in, he's a real role model machine of education like all of you guys today so that he would answer all your questions. Okay, thank you very much for attending. And let's go now. And really, as you see, one Kwan village aim is educational hub and Sino exchange together. Our aim is just to serve the sacred mission of education to help you guys that we know that you have a lot of challenges. We know that you have a lot of constraints in life because uh, as we all say, we are the forgotten missionaries of a sacred mission that very few believe in it. And we are the most important mission where the last stronghold between, between humankind and destruction of destruction. So stay with us and always one Kwan village and Sino exchange will be there always to assist you as much as we can in this sacred mission of education that you are doing it every day so that our students are right for today and ready for tomorrow. 